This is Garrett Hellenthal, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the POBE project, the People of the British Isles, which is a project managed by people at the University of Oxford. And they were looking at the, we were looking at the genetic history of the people of the United Kingdom. So I'm currently a researcher at University College London. When I started this project, I was also working at the University of Oxford. So first, a bit of background for those of you um, that might know a bit less about the area. So some of you might know quite a bit about genetics. Um, and so bear with me through this. But just to describe the type of data that we're using, we'll be using autosomal DNA as we analyze in this study, or at least for the results that I'll show you here. So you inherit 23 pairs of chromosomes um, from your parents. And so within each chromosome pair, you get one chromosome from mom, one from dad. I'm going to be focusing on 22 of them, which are the autosomes. And then the other pair is the so-called sex chromosomes, the X and Y chromosome, which determine your sex. I'll be ignoring those. And furthermore, for those of you that know a bit about the field um, or just inferring ancestry in general, a lot of different people use Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, and you might have heard about these things, where Y chromosomes are passed along from father to son, and mitochondrial DNA is passed along from the mother. And so you can learn about kind of um, sex-biased gene flow using um, that type of data. But I'm going to completely ignore that type of data and instead focus on which constitutes the most of the remainder of your DNA, which are these 22 autosomes. And one major advantage of doing that is that while you can't tell about sex-biased um, gene flow, you can't, you, the autosomes have much more information, so many thousands of times more, more information than the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. And so for any particular region uh, in your autosomes, you inherit two chromosomes representing that region, so one that you get from your mother and one from your father. And what your DNA is, is a sequence of A, G, Cs, and Ts. And so I've got a little cartoon example here of a very small part of your autosomal regions. This is a data that I've made up. And so you've got a sequence of A, G, Cs, and Ts in this region. And in fact, in total, you inherit a sequence of 3 billion A, G, Cs, and Ts from each parent. So obviously, this is just a very small example of that total region. And so furthermore, the vast majority of your DNA is identical between any two chromosomes that you might sample, either from two different individuals or from uh, your two chromosomes within you that you've inherited from your two parents. And so because it's identical, I'm interested in comparing differences amongst people, and so I'm going to ignore all the sites where they're identical. But every about 300 to 1,000 locations or genetic positions or so, you have sites that can differ amongst chromosomes in your sample. So, for example, here at the third location, um, there's a difference there, so you can either be a G or a T. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on the most common type of genetic variation, which are sites in your uh, DNA where a sample chromosome can be one of two things exactly, so only two things. So, for example, this third location, you can either have the G or the T and nothing else. And then I've got another example at the um, right end of this made-up region where either the sample chromosome can be a T or an A and nothing else. And again, so while these genetic differences are fairly rare, only about every 300 to 1,000 positions or so, because we have so much DNA, over 3 billion uh, positions in total, there's still enough of these uh, variable sites that we can make comparisons amongst people. And so furthermore, at each location, I don't particularly care uh, which letter you inherit, whether it's the A, G, C, or T, all I care about is the location. So again, you can be one of two things, so I only care about whether you're one type or the other type. And so I can imagine me just arbitrarily coding these or encoding them any way that I like, so I'm going to use black and white circles. So at this location over here where you can be either a G or a T on the left, I can just arbitrarily call one of them a black circle and one of them a white circle, and I'll do the same thing at the other location. Instead of keeping track whether you're a T or an A, I'll just call it either a black circle or a white circle. And so that's what the data looks like. So the second and final bit of biology you need to understand for this talk is how your DNA is inherited. So say at the top here, this is one of your parents, the DNA for any particular region. So say this is your mother's DNA. And so again, she's going to have two chromosomes representing that region. One she's inherited from her mother, your grandmother, which is in blue here, and then one that she's inherited from your grandfather in red. And now she's going to pass along a chromosome from this region to you, and then your father's going to pass along a chromosome as well, so that you have two chromosomes for this region again. Now, it turns out that for just concentrating on your mom for now and this picture here, she's not going to just pass along the blue or the red, but often passes along some combination of the two, like I have here. So this is, say, the chromosome that she passed along to you. And this is due to a process known as recombination. Um, and so you don't really need to know anything about recombination. It's a process that occurs during cell division, during meiosis. 
Um, other than that, it causes this to happen. So in this particular example, I've made a recombination happen in this cartoon just to the left of center. And the net result is that the left segment of DNA that you've inherited uh, can be traced back to your grandfather, while the right segment of DNA in blue can be traced back to your grandmother. And if I threw down my genetic markers, so my black and white circles, it would reflect this inheritance pattern. So these first two genetic markers in you match up to what your grandfather has, and then the last three match up to what your grandmother has. And so there's two kind of major consequences I want you to take home from this. Uh, so over the generations, your pieces of DNA are passed along in blocks like this. So here you get one block from your grandfather and one block from your grandmother. And same with the chromosome that you'll get from your dad and how you relate to your grandparents on that side. And so the other thing is that who you're most closely related to changes along the genome. So these first two genetic markers I'm most closely related to, you're most closely related to your grandfather, while at the uh, last three you're most closely related to your grandmother. So who you're related to changes along the genome. So here's another way of looking at the same thing using a tree. So now this is, uh, again, just any particular genetic region, and you've got your two chromosomes representing a region. So this is you at the very bottom of the tree. Those are your two chromosomes. Going one level up, those are your two parents. And then the colors at the top here, those are your four grandparents. So I've assigned each of your four grandparents a unique color and pattern. And what I can do is I can trace that DNA forward in time and color you according to the DNA that you've inherited from them. So going forward, just the next generation, so your parents, so your mom, for example, on the left, she's going to get a chromosome from each of your grandparents on that side. She'll have a blue and a green. And then same with your dad on the right. You'll get a chromosome from each of his parents. And then again, they're each going to pass along a chromosome to you, each of your parents are. But as we just pointed out, because of this recombination process, mom might pass along not just the blue or the green, but some mixture of the two. And same with dad passing along chromosomes uh, that relate to your grandparents on his side. Now, I can change the color scheme so that instead of coloring you by the DNA that you inherit from your grandparents, what about your great-grandparents? And so you've got eight of them. I'm not going to show another level of the tree, but I'm just going to color your grandparents by the DNA that they've inherited from their grandparents, i.e. your great-grandparents. And so you've got eight of them, and so eight distinct colors and patterns. And then let's trace that DNA forward to you as well. And so your parents are going to get to, say, starting at your mom at the left here, she's going to inherit a chromosome from each of her parents that are a mixture of your great-grandparents. So just as you're a mixture of the DNA of your grandparents, your parents are a mixture of the DNA of their grandparents. And so they might, their mixtures might look like this, and same with dad on the other side. And then again, they're going to pass along some combination of DNA from your grandparents to you. So maybe you look like this for this particular region. And in fact, overall, across your entire genome, you're expected to inherit an eighth of your DNA from each of your eight great-grandparents. In this particular region, um, I guess one of them got left out, but across your whole DNA, you'd expect to get an eighth from each one of them. But now I can go back, say, even much further to your great-great-great-great, etc. grandparents. So for example, if I go back 10 generations, you're going to have over a thousand ancestors 10 generations back, so many more than I've drawn here. But I can do the same game of coloring you uh, by the DNA that you've inherited from them. And now overall across your genome, you're only expected to inherit less than a thousandth of your DNA from any one of them. So say you look like this. And one key point I want you to note is that the segment sizes in you, when I color you by your ancestors from 10 generations ago, are smaller than when I colored you by your grandparents. And this is because there's many more generations between you and these ancestors 10 generations back than there was between you and your grandparents. So there's been more time for these recombinations to happen, which happen each generation, that makes your segments smaller when they get to you today. But another key point is that I can take any slice of time in the past, say 10 generations back, and then color your DNA by which ancestor from that time period you've inherited DNA from. And so here's you at the top of the slide now, say, with your DNA colored by um, what you've inherited from your ancestors 10 generations back. And then here are two other individuals unrelated to you colored by the DNA that they've inherited from their ancestors 10 generations back. Now, when I say unrelated in this case, I mean that these people aren't first or second cousins. They're unrelated in the familial sense. So if you took a random DNA collection of people off the street, that might be a collection of unrelated individuals, as long as any of them are related to each other. If they were, we just kind of randomly remove them from the sample. But a thing that I want you to note is that at any particular slice of time in the past, unrelated individuals can share the same ancestor. We're not actually unrelated in a genetic sense. If you go back far enough in time, we'll share ancestry. And if, for example, I have over a thousand ancestors 10 generations back, it's not inconceivable that some of them might have passed down DNA via some other family tree to some other individuals who, as far as I know, I'm not familiarly related to. 
And so here's an example in this cartoon of regions where these unrelated individuals nonetheless share the same ancestor for that region. And in fact, in any particular region, if you go back far enough in time, any two individuals, for example, me and you, will share an ancestor for that region. And so it's just a matter of how far back in time you need to go. So with some individuals, a key thing, a key point following from that is that you'll share an ancestor more recently with some individuals than others. So obviously, if you have a close relative, you might share an ancestor more recently with them than somebody you're more distantly related to or somebody you're unrelated to. And particularly, if I say, look at one part of my genome, it could be that I share an ancestor with individual A 10 generations back and individual B 20 generations back and individual C seven generations back. And maybe in all my sample, seven is the smallest number. So I'm most closely related to individual C at that particular part of my genome. But then I might be more closely related to individual A at the next part of my genome, because again, who you're related to changes along the genome. But what I can do is then I can take my DNA, so now this is me at the bottom, and I can compare it to the DNA of a bunch of unrelated individuals. And this is what I do in practice. We collect our data from people that, as far as we know, are not related in the terms of, of being uh, first or second cousins. But anyway, we can take the DNA of one of the individuals, compare it to all the other unrelated individuals, and now the colors here refer to which chromosome of these unrelated individuals am I most closely related to at each section of my genome relative to everybody else in the sample. And so how do we do this in practice? Well, if you recall, there is data here. So again, each one of these, you can imagine each one of these um, unique colors is just a unique sequence of these black and white circles that I showed you earlier. And so here's an example here where say I take one of the chromosomes from one of my individuals, and I'll call that H4, and I compare it to other people in my data set, so the DNA from other people in my data set, so that's H1, H2, H3. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to identify who has DNA patterns, whose black and white circle patterns match mine most closely at each location in the genome. So here, for example, this is a possible match. Um, so the first two genetic markers for H4 match up with those that H1 carries, and then the last three of H4 match up with the genetic markers that H2 carries. And so you might think that at these particular locations, the first two genetic markers or genetic variants, uh, H4 is more, cl more closely related to H1 out of all of these three, while at the last three locations, it's mo he's most closely related to H2 out of all the three individuals that you've sampled. And so again, because your ancestry changes along the genome, who you most closely match to might change along the genome is so. But this is how we try to identify exactly who you're most closely related to in the genome. It's just by matching up who shares the most, uh, who shares uh, black and white circle patterns or genetic variation patterns that are the most similar to yours. All right, so that's the background. So now we're um, going to apply this to some data uh, from people in the United Kingdom. So this is part of the POBI or the People of the British Isles project. So this is a project jointly run by uh, Walter Bodmer and Peter Donnelly at the University of Oxford. And what they did, or what Walter in particular did, was he collected DNA from 2,039 individuals who were sampled across rural areas of the United Kingdom. And so cities were avoided. And there was a further restriction that for each one of these 2,039 individuals, all four of that individual's grandparents had to be born within 80 kilometers of one another. And so, on this map, each yellow circle here is an individual, and they've been placed on the map based on the average of their four grandparents' birthplaces. And so cities are deliberately avoided. The aim of the study was to look at an older history of the United Kingdom, so to try to avoid any sort of recent migration in and around the UK that's happened in the last century or so. And so cities are avoided because often lots of migration happens into cities. Uh, and also, we wanted to get people whose grandparents, and so you can think of each person as being composed of 25% about of their DNA of each of their four grandparents. And then we were trying to get people whose grandparents had not moved much. They've been in the region for a while. And if all four grandparents had been in that region for a while, it's probable that their family extending back a while had been in that region for some time because it's even harder to move uh, around a century or so back. And so it's really kind of taking a snapshot back in time and trying to get people that had not moved from these regions or had been living in these regions for some amount of time. So we can look at the older history of the United Kingdom. And so for each one of these individuals, each one of these yellow dots, we added 520,000 genetic markers, so 520,000 of these black and white circles. And so one of the first questions that we were interested in was whether individuals living in the same area share similar genetics. So is it true that if you live in one region, you look genetically similar to your neighbors and look different from people in another region further away in the UK? And so to do this, what we did is we took our algorithms and we took each individual one at a time, 
and compared them to all the other individuals and identified which other individuals do they share lots of matching DNA patterns with. And in particular, we have an algorithm that can cluster individuals based on who shares lots of matching DNA patterns, which again suggests that they share lots of recent ancestors. So we've got a statistical algorithm that can do this. And we ran our algorithm on this data and it said that, okay, it took these 2,039 individuals and decided to cluster them into 53 different groups, where a cluster means that you're genetically similar to individuals that you're clustered with and subtly or in some way genetically different from individuals that you're not clustered with. And so what we can do is we can start with these 53 groups and then we can build a tree uh, by greedily merging similar clusters. So we can start with our 53 clusters. We can compare each one of them pairwise and identify which two clusters are the most similar to each other, meaning which two clusters have individuals that do share lots of matching DNA patterns between them. Not enough that they got clustered together in the first place, but still quite a lot. And we can find the two that share the most in that way and then merge those two clusters so that we have 52. And then we can do it again. So then we can compare all pairwise comparisons of my 52 clusters, identify who are the most genetically similar, merge them. And so then we've got 51 and then so on and so forth until we have only two clusters left, left at the beginning. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the results of this clustering analysis, starting from the top of this tree that we built, where we've got two different groups, and I'll step down to three groups, three clusters, four clusters, five clusters. And the intuition is that at the top of the tree, you're getting the biggest genetic differences amongst groups. So these are the last groups to, to merge. They're some, in some sense the least genetically similar. And then as you step down the tree, the differences are more and more subtle. And so starting at the top of the tree, the uh, biggest genetic difference that we see in the United Kingdom is that the people of Orkney look genetically different from the rest of the United Kingdom. And so on this map, each circle here is again an individual placed in the same location as they were before, so based on their four grandparents' birthplaces, and the colors refer to the different clusters. So I'm going to step down the tree. So if I have three clusters, the next biggest difference is that Wales looks genetically different uh, from the rest of the United Kingdom and Orkney. And then North and South Wales split as I move down the tree. And then Scotland, Northern Ireland, and North England split um, from the rest of England. Then Cornwall splits off and keep going. Uh, Westray splits. So we had DNA from different islands in Orkney, and they split at this level of the tree. And then uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland split from the rest of Northern England at this level of the tree. So kind of as a point of comparison, as I say, as we move down the tree, the differences are getting more and more subtle. So in some sense, you could say that the people of Cornwall are more genetically distinct from the people of England than individuals in Scotland and Northern Ireland are genetically different from the people of Northern England. So moving forward, uh, the next split is the Welsh border. So you get this kind of bordering effect um, where the people that live along the border of Wales and England look slightly genetically distinct. And then Devon splits at the next level of the tree. And so as you recall, one of the questions that we had is whether there was um, a correlation between genetics and geography. And at this point, it becomes quite clear that there is to the point where we can tell whether you were sampled in or whether you come from Devon or Cornwall just by looking at your DNA. And in fact, in this case, the differences fall nicely along the county lines that we've drawn in white. And then going forward uh, a bit further, so we've got Northeast Scotland splits next. And then um, Southern Wales splits into North and South Pembrokeshire. And so a plausible or possible explanation for this, we don't so trying to kind of identify why these genetic differences exist is, is somewhat tricky. Um, you can come up with all kinds of stories as to why this might be the case. And so one that's potentially a plausible explanation for this is for a long time, for many centuries, in this part of southern Wales, there were distinct groups of villages, some of which were Welsh-speaking and some of which, which were English-speaking. And they were separated by the so-called Leinster Line, and one of them is referred to at some point in history as the Little England Beyond Wales, the English speaking part. And so it's possible that this is a genetic remnant of that signal, of that, um, those divisions, so that these two separate uh, areas on either side of the so called Langster line, Langs Lansker line, sorry, uh, did not intermix with each other too much, or at least for a number of generations, so that now we can kind of tell them apart genetically today. We don't quite know if that's the answer, but it's a possible explanation. Then going forward, um, I'm not going to go through all the splits, but next is Lancaster and West Yorkshire split, and Cumbria and Newcastle and Durham. Uh, then you get splits within the Scottish Highlands and Northern Ireland to the point where some of the Northern Irish are um, genetically similar to people in Southern Scotland, and then other Northern Irish are genetically similar to people in the West and North of Scotland. 
This plausibly has a source in um, the so-called Ulster plantations of the 1600s. So King James I um, sent a bunch of people from these exact parts of southern Scotland and northern England uh, to try to grab land in Northern Ireland to make a claim on it and take it away from the um, Gaelic-speaking inhabitants. And I guess it was a very large migration. And it could be that if these people migrated over in an attempt to take over the land and claim it for for James, that the locals may not be a, might, might not have been too keen to intermix with them. So that as a remnant of that lack of intermixing, we can now tell genetic differences between these two groups today. And so then moving forward, uh, Cheshire versus Forest of Dean split. Then the tip of Cornwall splits from the rest of Cornwall. And as I said, we can keep going further, but um, the genetic differences get more and more subtle. At some point, you're just kind of splitting out a couple of individuals that look slightly different um, or maybe are slightly more related to each other than they are to other members in the data set. And so I'm going to stop at this level of the tree. And for the rest of the analyses I talk about here, I'll use this level of the, the tree, which is where we have 17 different clusters. Um, but one thing to note is that even if you go down to 53 clusters, while we are getting this kind of fine scale detail across many regions of the United Kingdom, where we can, we can tell apart very geographically localized regions genetically, there's still this gigantic red cluster in Southeast England that never splits, even if we go down to 53. And so despite the fact that we're getting these kind of very subtle genetic differences, there's a big part of the um, United Kingdom where, as far as we can tell, the people are fairly genetically homogeneous. They look very similar. And so... The next thing we wanted to think about is why do different regions of the UK differ genetically? And so one thing to note is that the differences are extremely subtle. So different UK clusters are much more similar genetically than, say, differences between countries in Europe. So the differences are very subtle. But nonetheless, they clearly exist. And there seems to be a correlation with geography suggesting that they're probably real. This isn't just noise or something in our algorithm. And so one possible reason and certain explanation for some of these differences is that they're due to isolation. So just the basic fact that people like to intermingle with people that they live near to. So it's easier to do that and then intermix with people somewhere further away in the country. But it could also be due, some of these genetic differences might be due to different migrations into the UK throughout history. And so we wanted to look at this last question a bit further. And before I do so, I'll give you a very brief abridged history of the United Kingdom, omitting several things, but just giving you a few key highlights. And so in 6500 BC, Great Britain became an island. So before then, they were connected to continental Europe, and so people could have colonized uh, the UK via the land bridge connecting Europe, and also the, probably by boat up the coasts. Uh, but after 6500, it would have had to all be by boat. In 4000 BC, agriculture arrived to Britain, and that's important because it allows the population size to get bigger, and once that happens, people might spread out to different areas. Fast forwarding quite a bit further, the Roman occupation of large parts of England and Scotland was between 43 and 410. Interestingly, it's believed that the Romans didn't migrate um, from the Italian part or the southern part of their empire in large numbers. They were largely known for just sort of setting up a system of roads and taxation and infrastructure, but letting the locals largely get on with it. And so we might think that the genetic impact of the Roman Empire was fairly small. Now, in contrast, uh, following the collapse of the Roman Empire, there were large-scale migrations uh, known as the Anglo-Saxon migrations. So these are the Jutes, Angles, and Saxons uh, who settled into these areas in red in England and parts of Scotland uh, in the 5th and 6th centuries. And so in contrast to the Romans, it is believed they did migrate here in large numbers. And in fact, it's been an open question as to whether they migrated in such large numbers that they completely displaced the original inhabitants. So that if I looked at an Englishman today, genetically, they'd be 100% Anglo-Saxon. And going forward a bit uh, further, there are additional Norse Viking migrations in the um, 9th and 10th centuries. And they came along the north of England and settled along the west side as well. In fact, Norway annexed Orkney um, for 500 years until the 1460s or so as part of these, following these migrations. And there's been some other uh, activity. So Danish Viking uh, migrations that settled into an area known as Dane Loss, that includes areas such as modern day Leicester um, in 865. And then, of course, the last successful invasion of the UK were the Normans in 1066. But like the Romans, it was believed that the Normans did not migrate in large numbers. They might have sent a ruling elite, a small amount of people to control the population um, and institute their laws and customs, but they might not have migrated here in large enough numbers to leave a big genetic impact. And so one thing we noted is that when we compare this um, history 
picture, and in particular this picture of the Anglo-Saxon migrations and where they went, it bears a striking resemblance to this gigantic red cluster that we inferred in our analyses. And so a possible explanation for why this area is so genetically homogeneous is that is the impact of the Anglo-Saxons. And so to try to learn about this and see if this might be the case, we could take the U DNA of our UK individuals and compare them to different parts of Europe with the aim of identifying do different UK regions share matching DNA patterns with different parts of Europe. And so to do so, we require European data, and we had quite a lot of it. We had 6,200 individuals. Um, now, in contrast to our UK study, we didn't have grandparent information on any of these individuals. So we didn't know where all four of their grandparents came from. In fact, these individuals came from a study on multiple sclerosis. Um, and so on this map of Europe here, continental Europe, each circle represents a hospital. And all we know is that somebody with multiple sclerosis walked into that hospital. And uh, otherwise, we don't know anything about them. And so the first thing we tried to do to see if there's any sort of correlation between where these individuals were sampled from and um, geography or genetics, genetics in these uh, geographic sampling locations, we took these individuals and we clustered them, just as we did with our UK data set. And here are the results of 51 clusters. So on this map here, again, I said each circle is a um, hospital location. There are 51 different colors for the different um, clusters, and for each hospital, there's a pie chart showing the proportion of individuals from that hospital that were assigned to each of the 51 clusters. And so, for example, if I look at, um, say, southern France, there's a group of individuals in a cluster 31. So there's one hospital in um, southeast France where all the individuals are assigned to cluster 31, and then the hospital location just next to it, it looks about half the individuals are maybe assigned to 31 and half of them are slightly more than that, were assigned to a different cluster, 28. And so even though um, we didn't do the strict sampling criterion, there's still a clear structuring uh, or a clustering, sorry, a clear correlation between um, these clusters and geography. Um, you can just see that visually a lot of colors are clustering together. And so different countries seem to have similar color patterns suggesting that um, genetically they're somewhat similar and more different from other countries further away. That's the subject of a different study. But again, for this analysis, we were just interested in taking our UK clusters or individuals and comparing them to each of these 51 European clusters, in particular to identify which parts of Europe they share most recent ancestry with. And does that differ across the UK? Is the UK matched to different parts of Europe in different regions? And so to do this, going back to my cartoon, so now what I'm doing is the individuals at the bottom here, that's a UK individual. And the unrelateds I'm comparing to are all these different clusters across Europe. And so say that uh, I get colored in this particular way, this is how I match up to all these different individuals in Europe. And so say that I furthermore know that these first four unrelated individuals were sampled from Northwest France and Belgium hospital locations, and these last three from uh, North Germany and Denmark locations. Well, I can assign unique colors to those two, uh, those individuals based on where they come from, so yellow and red, and then I can go and color this UK individual based on who they matched up to. Now suddenly it looks as if this individual is a mixture of the red and yellow segments or a mixture of the North German Denmark groups and Northwest France Belgian groups. And in fact, I'm going to, I did pick these groups for a specific reason, as I'll show you a bit later. But more generally, this might be the case of, say, there's a local population uh, represented by the yellow, then a migrating group came into that region, and the migrants in particular might be the Anglo-Saxons, so say that they migrated into that region and intermixed with the local population. Well, if that happened, then the DNA of people today from those regions that descended from this mixture event will have a mixture of DNA from both of those sources. So we'll have these yellow segments and red segments. And interestingly, we can also, by looking at the DNA of people today, we can determine precisely when this mixing happened by considering the size of the red and yellow segments. So generally speaking, the larger the uninterrupted red and yellow, the more recently the two groups mixed. Well, the shorter the red and yellow segments, the longer ago the two groups mixed. If you recall, when I um, colored you according to the DNA, when I matched you up to your grandparents, those segments were longer than if I matched you up to your great, great, great grandparents. And so it's the exact same idea. Uh, so basically, you can use the size of segments in people today as a clock to count back how many generations ago the two groups intermixed. And in particular, and this might be a bit more detailed than you care to know, the segment sizes are exponentially distributed. So the sizes of these red and yellow segments in that previous example will follow an exponential distribution and like so, so I've got some illustrated here, and the rate of decay of that distribution will depend on how long ago the groups mixed. So if they mixed five generations ago, as depicted with this black line, you'll have lots of fairly long segments relative to if the two groups mixed 50 generations ago, which is the dark blue line, in which case you won't have very many long segments 
at all. But again, the intuition is just the more, the longer ago it was, the smaller the segments are because there's been more recombinations. Okay, so now you might reasonably be asking if there's any evidence at all that our methods work. And so to try to convince you of that, we tried some simulations using our European data that I just showed you. So in particular, we mixed two different European groups uh, such that 75% of the DNA came from these uh, individuals that were sampled from hospitals in dark blue here, which are largely across Italy or entirely across Italy, mainly South Italy. And then 25% uh, of the DNA coming from, we mixed that Italian DNA with individuals sampled from a North German hospital location in red here, such that 25% of the DNA came from the North Germans. And we simulated this mixture to occur 40 generations ago. And then we asked, can we identify precisely which groups mixed? And here's our inference on the right, and it turns out that we can. So using all 50 of our groups, our model was able to infer precisely which groups mixed and figured out exactly which hospitals intermixed in the simulated example. And if you look at these bar charts here, the true and the estimated, we can see that um, we also got the proportion of admixture right. We were able to figure out that it was 25% from the North German individuals and 75% from Italy. And furthermore, if I look at the size of segments of these uh, segments that are inherited from the Italy and North Germany locations, they follow an exponential distribution. So the sizes are depicted with this black line here. And the green line depicts our best fitting exponential distribution, uh, which ends up having a rate of 40, which is exactly when we simulated the admixture to occur. So we're able to determine precisely when these two groups mixed as well, with a confidence band of about 18 to 55 generations to put some uncertainty around it. Okay, so hopefully that convinces you that these methods do work, and so now we can try to look at the UK and um, if they've inherited DNA from Europe, and if so, when. And so that's what this plot is showing. First of all, just the proportion of matching to Europe. And so it's a bit of a busy plot, and I'll try to walk you through it. So there's 17 different columns here. Each column refers to one of my 17 UK clusters, and the colors uh, along the x-axis here, so at the bottom underneath each column, those colors correspond to the map of the UK. And I've ordered populations going left to right in the columns here, roughly as they go south to north in this UK map in the um, bottom right. And so, for example, Cornwall's in the far, far left, and then you've got Devon next to it, and going on. The fourth column is the big yellow, um, so it used to be red, but now I've changed the color to yellow for that gigantic England cluster. And then as you keep going, you hit Wales, and eventually Scotland, and then Orkney Islands are at the very far right uh, endpoint. Okay, and then so those are the 17 different UK groups. And then each bar plot is showing the proportion of DNA matching from that group to all of these different regions of Europe. And then the color code then for these bars is given in the top left map of continental Europe. And so, for example, you can see in Cornwall, that they map quite a lot to locations 29 and 30 and 32. And if you look in this map, it's hard to read the numbers, but you can look at the colors and you can see that that largely matches to um, France and then uh, other parts of uh, Belgium as well. And so one thing to note is that even though you've got the potential for 51 different colors then in each of these columns, there's much, much fewer than that. There's maybe only about 10 or so colors in total. And so whole parts of continental Europe the UK, perhaps not surprisingly, doesn't match up to at all. So, for example, Italy, we talked about how there's probably no Roman contribution. That doesn't appear to be the case here. There's no matching to Italy. There's no matching to Finland, very little matching to Sweden, et cetera. And so I'll walk you through what some of the um, interesting or strongest matches are. Um, one thing to note, though, is just that some of these regions in the bar plots are shaded. They're much lighter, and those are areas that we couldn't statistically tell apart from zero, so you can just sort of ignore them. So I'll focus on these regions in gray first. So this represents matching to these uh, boxed areas that I've highlighted in the European map. And so that's largely, as you can see, northwest France and then also parts of Belgium and I think a bits of northern Germany or central northern Germany. So these gray bits, as you can see, are found in each of our UK clusters, so all 17. The fact that they're found everywhere makes us believe that this genetic signal is old. This is DNA that's come into the UK from somewhere in continental Europe or related to ancestors of continental Europe. And it's had time to spread across the entirety of the United Kingdom. So now that we see it everywhere today. Now, in contrast, some DNA matches to Europe only in certain areas and is absent in others. So a key example is cluster 33, which I've gotten tan here. That represents matching to people in northern Germany today, from the hospital location in northern Germany. And we, as you can see, we only find it in our UK clusters in England. So it's entirely absent from Wales and absent from Scotland and the Orkney Islands. 
And so the fact that it matches to these specific parts of northern Germany and it's only found in England makes us believe it's related to the Anglo-Saxon migration because that's the part of the world that they came from and the part of the regions of the UK that they settled into. Now, we also have Danish DNA uh, that's represented with purple here. And so you might think that they would be a good representative of the Anglo-Saxons. But note that our Danish DNA, so at the very top of these bar plots, is also found everywhere across the UK, making us think that some of it, like the gray segments, are old. But if you can, it's clear to also see that it's highest, the purple components are highest in these regions that copy from cluster 33 or that match to northern Germany. And so that makes us believe that some of the Danish matching is also related to the Anglo-Saxons. Now, if you add the North German and Danish components together, it suggests that about 10 to 40 percent, we also incorporate some additional uncertainty, maybe 10 to 40 percent of the DNA of these individuals in England matches to these regions and thus was inherited from the Anglo-Saxons. So if you recall at the beginning, I said or earlier, I said that there was an open question as to whether the Anglo-Saxons completely displaced the original inhabitants. Well, these results suggest no. It looked like the Anglo-Saxons intermixed with the original inhabitants. So most of the DNA from these regions in England looks similar to Wales and Scotland and the rest of the UK. But only a small component seems to be different, uh, suggesting that even on a minority of the DNA of an Englishman on average today relates to these Anglo-Saxon migrations. There's another component uh, highlighted with brown here that we're less sure about what this refers to. So it's found in England, but also Scotland. So like the Anglo-Saxon components is found in England, but also additionally in parts of Scotland, which makes us think that it's not related to the Anglo-Saxons. Also the fact that it matches to France, which isn't an obvious part of the world that would match to the Anglo-Saxons genetically, you would think. Um, so we're not quite sure what this refers to, but the fact that it's found in these other locations more than just England makes us think it's older than the Anglo-Saxon events, but not so old that it's had time to spread everywhere. So it could be some other migration event that, it, that um, happened prior to the Anglo-Saxons. And finally, the last thing I'd like to point out is the matching to Norway in green. And so you can see that there's a bit of matching to Norway everywhere in the United Kingdom, but that it's much higher in the Orkney Islands. And again, that's consistent with their history, the fact that Orkney was annexed by Norway um, for 500 years. And if we add up these green components, it suggests that about that, um, those migrations and that history has resulted in about 25% of the DNA of a person from Orkney on average matching to modern day Norwegians. And so the sum total of everything I've just talked about and shown you looks like this, and that basically covers all the signals that we see. There's a few things, maybe a tiny amount in, from Sweden, matching to Sweden and matching to Spain. But the vast majority, perhaps not surprisingly, of the DNA that matches in the UK matches to these countries that surround the UK geographically as they're boxed in this continental Europe picture. Okay, and again, um, we can date these contributions to try to see if it really is the Anglo-Saxon and Norwegian Viking migrations that are leading to these signals, signals that we see. And so we took the DNA from this uh, big yellow cluster, starting at this top row here, and we dated the segments that seem to be coming from Northern Germany and Denmark. And that date's shown on the right. Here's our curve and date. It gives us a date of 858 uh, CE or AD. And then on the bottom, we dated the uh, Norwegian Viking, the Norwegian segments, in our Orkney Islands individuals, and that dates to about 110. And so both of these dates are actually too recent, if you recall the history that I showed you. Uh, the Norwegian stuff's probably okay, because as I said, uh, Norway annexed Orkney from about the 900s to 1460 or so. And so any time during that time, there might have been mixture between Norway and the people of Orkney. But the date at the top, the Anglo-Saxon migrations ended at about 600, and yet we get a date of 858, which is much more recent. Now, we still think this is okay because any sort of intermixing that happens between two groups necessarily has to happen after the group migrates there. It can't happen before the group comes. And it could be that if there's an invading force, such as the Anglo-Saxons, that come in, the locals may not be too keen to mix with them for a number of generations. So perhaps they stayed separate from one another in their separate encampments and didn't intermix in large enough numbers that we can detect it genetically for a number of centuries later. And that's what these results seem to suggest. And so just a few conclusions. So hopefully I've convinced you that DNA is an incredibly powerful tool to infer ancestral history. So we just took DNA by itself and was, were able to infer all of these different mixing events and these how different groups relate to one another and how the UK relates to continental Europe. And in particular, autosomal DNA is what we used here, and that carries lots of information as you have 
unrelated individuals that inherit blocks of DNA from different ancestors along the genome. So you've got lots of different ancestors, lots of different independent segments of the genome for which to make inference from. So that's a big difference between that and Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, which is commonly used in many of these studies. And what helps in particular is that we have a lot of DNA. So there's over 3 billion base pairs. Here we only use 520,000 genetic markers, but we can get many more, up to tens of millions, as data sets that are coming out nowadays. And in our application to the United Kingdom data set, which is part of the POBE, People of the British Isles project, we found that genetics is strongly correlated with geography across the United Kingdom, but not always. You have this gigantic South England cluster uh, where everybody seems fairly genetically homo homogeneous. Uh, and then by comparing the United Kingdom to different parts of England, uh, sorry, to continental Europe, we saw that England seems to be a mixture of original groups, or which I mean pre-Saxon groups, and Anglo-Saxon migrants, and that Orkney appears to be a mixture of these original groups and Norwegian Viking migrants, but that in each case, uh, the migrating people seem to have left only a minority of a DNA contribution, somewhere less than 50%. And so some future work is to apply these methods to bigger data sets, and there's now data sets coming out with tens of thousands of UK individuals and millions of genetic markers, and then also use DNA from ancient human remains. So rather than relying on modern-day Danish and North Germans to reflect Anglo-Saxons, it'd be ideal to actually have DNA from Anglo-Saxons and identify whether that is the genetic contribution and exactly might help us nail down the proportions a bit more precisely of DNA that we've inherited from them. Um, and so that sort of data is, is becoming more and more prominent. It's becoming easier to get DNA from some of these ancient grave sites or burial grounds. So that's all I have, and just a few acknowledgements. I'd like to thank um, some people that developed the methods with uh, Simon Myers at the University of Oxford. Daniel Felouche is now at Swansea, and Daniel Lawson at the University of Bristol. Uh, POBE, as I mentioned, was jointly run by Walter Bodner and Peter Donnelly at Oxford. And Stephen Leslie in Melbourne um, did a lot of the nice pictures of clusters, and also Bruce Winnie, um, who was at Oxford at the time, did a lot of the work. And also, I'd really like to thank the POBE volunteers, so of course, all the people that donated their DNA um, to Walter and the other people that collected it. Uh, the study would not have been possible without them. I'm funded by the Wellcome Trust and Royal Society, so I'd like to thank them. And then also, if you want to look further into any of these things, here are a few references, including the methodology, and in particular, all of the results on the um, UK analysis is described in this paper, Leslie et al., at the bottom. So thank you.